presented annually by the Turchin Center for the Visual Arts as part of an Appalachian Summer Festival and offers a fascinating glimpse into the creative process inspiring the visual and performing artists whose work is featured by the festival, as well as important topics in the humanities that are of interest to our audience. We're honored to be presenting this session in partnership with the Center for Judaic, Holocaust and Peace Studies and the 19th annual Martin and Doris Rosen Virtual Summer Symposium. Related to our mission of fostering learning through the sharing of knowledge, we would like to acknowledge that the land where we are gathered here is the original homeland of the Cherokee people. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory, and we honor and respect the remarkable ongoing contributions of the Cherokee community to our mountain culture. It's now my pleasure to introduce our good friend, Dr. Thomas Pegalo Kaplan. Dr. Pegalo Kaplan holds the Leon Levine Distinguished Professorship in Judaic Holocaust and Peace Studies here at Appalachian State. Dr. Pekalo Kaplan's research focuses on histories of violence, language, and culture of Nazi Germany and Nazi-occupied Europe and the 1960s global youth revolts. His broader project is a linguistic history of comparative genocide in the modern world. He is an ardent supporter of transatlantic and international scholarly exchanges and has partnered with the Church and Center's Lunch and Learn series during the symposium for many years. We will now turn over the program to Dr. Pegalo Kaplan, who will introduce our moderator for today's session. Thank you very much, uh, Denise. It's really a pleasure. Welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, it's always fantastic to collaborate uh, with, uh, with App Summon, also with the Turchin Center. Um, so this is part uh, also of the 19th, the 19th annual uh, summer uh, symposium on the Holocaust, the Rosen Symposium. Uh, which this year focuses specifically on children in the Shoah, on children in the Shoah. Uh, we've been working uh, with a number of very motivated teachers from across the country and also, in fact, um, going into uh, Europe. And we're very, very happy to be able to share this uh, program here and also to reach other audiences, uh, the normal Lunch and Learn audience uh, for uh, the Turchin. Um, before I uh, introduce uh, my uh, dear colleague and the co-director uh, of the uh, symposium, uh, Dr. Russell Wyman, known of course to many of you already, I would of course like to acknowledge uh, the key supporters who have made this symposium uh, possible, uh, especially the Conference uh, on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, uh, the Rosen Endowment, of course, uh, ASU with its College of Arts and Sciences, uh, Echoes and Reflections, uh, the International School for Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem, of course, Israel, uh, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, especially the Levine Institute, uh, but also the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies, uh, the Leon Levine Foundation, uh, the NC Council on the Holocaust, and of course, also the great many supporters and donors to the center without whose uh, you know, ongoing support we couldn't be able to do the work uh, we are doing. I invite, of course, all of you to take advantage to the remaining programs. We finish here on uh, Friday, and I just uh, put the program in the link for everybody with registration uh, links also available. So now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Russell uh, Wyman who has uh, received uh, much uh, international acclaim and numerous awards for innovative and groundbreaking efforts in Holocaust education for many years, what I'm saying decades, who work in diplomacy and international conflict, uh, museum and creative arts, education and curriculum development, social welfare and minority rights. Uh, you know, of course, Denise uh, rightfully mentioned the Shiroki uh, and uh, genocide against Native Americans uh, and First Nations. Uh, curricular development uh, and the like has been sought after in more than 30 nations. In addition to North America, she lectures and appears in print and media in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, not just the Philippines, Indonesia, but far beyond uh, Europe and Australia. Dr. Wyman has served as director of several institutions in academia and in the public sector, recently working on multicultural, interreligious and international State Department projects on prejudice uh, and uh, education and dialogue. Uh, the distinguishing features, awards, uh, projects are so numerous that I would take a long time to do it justice. Uh, we have a full link on our website, everybody, of course, to share. So now it's my great uh, honor and pleasure uh, to, in fact, give you the screen is all yours, Russell, please. Thank you so much, Tomas. I wanted to uh, welcome both the uh, uh, teachers and the community uh, at, at large. 
thank again Denise and Tomas for being able to do collegiate uh, uh, work together, uh, which combines both the university and the community in many wonderful ways. I also want to thank Denise for mentioning the Cherokee Nation and remember exactly each time the layers of what brought us to this moment in time for us to be together, both the where, the how, the what, and the who. Um, I want to tell you, uh, this is going to be an unconventional introduction because I have known uh, Al Munzer, Dr. Munzer, for now nine years. And uh, I want you to know that Al Munzer was my birthday present. In uh, December 12th, 12, 12, 12, 2012, uh, I went to have a birthday, a much needed uh, vacation in Bali, uh, Indonesia. And I got a call, got a message from a Christian uh, minister in Indonesia, Jakarta, who said, I have something that you've been looking for. And he sent me a uh, small article that was translated from the Dutch Indonesian to me. And uh, you wouldn't believe it, but I actually wanted to call my Bali uh, vacation short because I couldn't wait to find the person who was on the name of the uh, cited in this article. There was a, I was just had come off of a major work between interfaith dialogue in um, in Southeast Asia, we were trying to reach uh, the Muslim communities there. Indonesia itself is the fourth largest country in the world and has more Muslims there than the entire Arab world put together. Um, and they had only uh, heard about, if they heard about the Holocaust at all, it was within the context of Holocaust denial, that it didn't happen. Uh, and as somebody active in interfaith, but also bringing uh, my Jewish story to the, to the community, I was deeply frustrated when I was doing work between Catholic, uh, Christians and Muslims. And therefore this Christian minister in gratitude to me went looking. And what he found was a article that at Yad Vashem, a uh, Dr. Alfred Munzer from uh, Washington DC area had uh, get, uh, uh, achieved the award of nominating uh, Indonesians, Indonesian um, people uh, cited at Indonesia uh, for saving his life during the Holocaust. It was a remarkable moment because as you all know, the Holocaust physically happened in Europe. So I wanted to know more. And as soon as I got back to the States, I left a message for Dr. Munzer at, his, at the hospital that he was working at. And I said, please call me, Dr. Wyman. And I think he might've thought it might've been a medical emergency uh, and uh, called me right back. And I said, uh, would you be, well, are you the little boy who was saved by Indonesians during the Holocaust. That was what I said. And he said, yes. And I said, would you be willing to talk to a group of State Department Indonesian Fulbright fellows, a group of, um, of Indonesian students at Philadelphia Temple University and tell them your story. And that was the beginning of a saga. We call it Indonesian lullaby, he'll tell you why. Um, and this extraordinary man, he'll tell you his story. He's been doing it beautifully for the last almost 10, for many, many years, but the last 10 years has been remarkable audiences around the world. And I did bring him back to Indonesia to speak, in fact, to 400 Indonesian youth. Uh, we went to many different uh, venues. And one of the most important ones, a breakthrough, was at the Indonesian uh, embassy in Washington, D.C. itself. Obviously, he spoke to State Department, uh, military people, incredible about the incredible rescue. Uh, and I don't want to tell his story. He'll tell his story. But I do want you to know that this man, uh, which he will not tell as part of his story, uh, is, was a pulmonary, he is a doctor still, pulmonary uh, specialist. He, one, once a doctor, always a doctor. And uh, he headed up some incredible initiatives in the American Lung Association, both uh, uh, nationally and internationally. And I could tell you that he credited, I credit him personally um, uh, uh, for saving many lives uh, through uh, making sure the warning against secondhand smoke uh, and many other things that he did uh, to help uh, make uh, the world a better place because of uh, smoking and other issues uh, has not had, he had uh, done amazing amount of, um, of not just medical work, but actually something that's more difficult, working in the public sphere in political and, uh, and the community to making sure that legislation has been changed and that initiatives are taken around the world. So when you think that one Jewish baby's life 
was saved for many reasons, and that in itself is wonderful, but also the amount of people and lives that he himself has saved over the years, in my estimation, uh, this uh, little boy, Al, Alfred Munzer, uh, that grew up to be an incredible, uh, made incredible and continues to make incredible contributions to mankind, is a man who I feel privileged to call friend and colleague. I'd like to introduce him now because he has, he has, an, he has not only an extraordinary uh, story to tell, but he knows in each and every way um, how to bring out the many different folds and manifold ways that the Holocaust uh, must be remembered, uh, sanctified, but also uh, as a cautionary tale for the rest of the world. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Rachel, for a wonderful introduction. And thank you, uh, Appalachian State University, for giving me this opportunity uh, to spend uh, some time with you and to tell you the story uh, of my family. Uh, as you heard, uh, I am a physician, a lung specialist, and for many years, uh, I've done a lot of public speaking, uh, talking about the dangers of smoking, uh, tuberculosis, dangers of air pollution, and all of the speaking was, was quite easy. Uh, but today I'm going to be sharing a story uh, that's much more personal, that's much closer to my heart and to my being, and that's the story of my family during the Holocaust. Uh, I can't tell you uh, the whole story of the entire Holocaust. Uh, you know, for that, you'd have to go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., or read any of the books or take any of the courses uh, that are available. All I can talk about today is really what happened uh, during the Holocaust to one small family. But multiply that experience a million times over, a million different stories to get a feeling of what the Holocaust uh, was really all about. Uh, I'm going to be uh, showing some photographs uh, as I go along. Bear with me as I uh, screen share and share sound. And here we are. And I'm going to do it from the beginning. Good. And uh, here is the first photograph that I'm sharing with you. Now, if I were speaking to a group of students, uh, I would ask them what it is they see. And invariably, they will tell me, well, you know, it's a woman holding a child, a baby. And uh, then I will usually ask them, well, you know, is the woman wearing a particular costume? Is she of a particular color? Can you determine what country that woman might be from? And eventually someone will say, well, somewhat, somewhere in Asia. Some people will say the Philippines. And eventually someone will say Indonesia. And then I ask them, well, who do you think the baby is? that she's holding. And you know, after some hesitation, someone invariably, very daringly will say, could it be you? And then I say, yes. And I'm going to tell you a story, how it was that this woman born in Indonesia came to be connected to this little baby born thousands of miles from Indonesia. How they came, became connected and how that woman came to save that little baby's life so that that baby could be with you uh, today. Well, I'll begin by telling you about my parents. They were born uh, in Eastern Europe, a uh, part of the world that was the Austro-Hungarian Empire until the First World War, and then became part of Poland. When it became part of Poland, uh, there was the advent of anti-Semitism, uh, and so lives really changed for people of living there. My father was born in a small town called Kanchuga, and my mother in my mother in a neighboring town uh, called Rimanov. Now people have this idea of these little towns, these shtetls, as they're called in Yiddish as being fairly backwards. 
perhaps it's from having watched uh, the movie of Fiddler on the Roof or the play one too many times. But in actual fact, one of the people who came from Rimanov, my mother's hometown, was a man by the name of Isidore Rabi. Isidore Rabi came to the United States and was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1946. So here you have it, a big brain coming from a very, very poor small town somewhere uh, in Poland. It also makes you wonder about all of the big brains that were lost during the Shoah who lived in that small town called Rimanov. Well, as I said, with the advent of an increased anti-Semitism and with few opportunities in the towns, uh, Jewish young people left their homes at an early age, usually uh, at about age 18. My father went directly to the Netherlands where he started a men's clothing business. But my mother instead joined her older siblings uh, in uh, Berlin. Berlin being the big go-to city for young people who wanted to have a future. Uh, and my mother arrived in Berlin uh, in the early 1920s, just about the same time that Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, was being published. Of course, that's the book in which he sets forth his entire racist ideology, especially targeting Jews. But my mother at age 18 wasn't particularly interested in politics and she certainly uh, had no interest at all uh, in uh, reading Adolf Hitler's book. She was much more interested in playing with her two little nephews, my cousin Norbert, whom we will meet again a little bit later, and my cousin Yossi and Norbert's mother, my aunt Helen, sitting in the background uh, in the park. Well, my mother remained in Berlin until the end of 1932. Then she joined her childhood sweetheart, my father in The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, and that's where they were married early in December, 1932. That is just about two months before Adolf Hitler approached the aging president of Germany, Paul von Hindenburg, and asked him to be made chancellor of Germany. Unfortunately, von Hindenburg acceded, and of course that started the entire Nazi era. But in Holland, people felt safe. You know, Jews had lived in, in Holland for hundreds of years. There was no anti-Semitism. They occupied all elements of society. And my father's business, my father's men's clothing business in The Hague flourished. Uh, and so in July, 1936, July 12, 1936, my parents celebrated the birth of their first child. That was my sister, Eva. And, you know, life could, and then, the next, uh, in 1938, uh, in November, on November 12, 1938, they celebrated the birth of another child. And that was my sister, Leah. Another happy occasion, except this time, the occasion was marred by news from neighboring Germany. The outbreak of Kristallnacht just two days earlier, which marked really when the full fury of anti-Semitism was unleashed in Germany. So here you have it, a happy occasion while the Nazi era is taking this further terrible, violent step in neighboring Germany. Of course, you know, uh, the remaining Jews, including of course, my, my uncle, my mother's brother, who was in Berlin, uh, it was for them, it was a signal to try to get out of Germany and make you know, every possible effort to find a place that might be willing to take in Jewish refugees. 
There were very few places like that. But fortunately, there was one country uh, that my uncle, my uncle Abraham, uh, was able uh, to get a visa to, and that was Bolivia in South America, one of the poorest countries at that time and remaining today, one of the poorest countries. And here you have my Aunt Helen sitting on a ship uh, and my little cousin Norbert on a ship bound for South America. Next to my little cousin Norbert is another little boy. And I have been intrigued uh, to find out who this very studious little boy is. Well, he and my cousin Norbert ended up becoming best friends on that ship and remained close friends for the rest of their lives. This little boy's name is Ulrich Knapfelmacher. And Ulrich, or Uli, as he was known, came, eventually left Bolivia, came back to, came to the United States and retired eventually as the head of the English department at Princeton University. And I finally was able to locate him about two weeks ago. And he and I have been corresponding and talking on the telephone uh, since then. Little Uli is now 90 years old. And I'm due to talk with him a bit later again today. And will certainly uh, mention uh, the conference that I spoke at uh, just now. And to this day, I still have relatives uh, as a result of this save of the, my uncle being saved, I still have relatives living in uh, Bolivia. Well, not all Jews were able to, to gain uh, admission to a faraway refuge in a faraway country. Some of them just managed to cross the border into the Netherlands. And that's what happened to my father's brother, my uncle Emil, who now joined our family in Holland just after stealthily crossing the border in Holland. And here you see my uncle Amy <coughs> holding my sister Leah, my father Holland holding uh, my sister Eva, enjoying a day in the park. Again, trying to continue with their normal lives in spite of what was happening in neighboring Germany, still feeling safe. <coughs> well, all that changed on May 14th, 1940. The evening prior to May 14th, my parents had been asked to shelter a man who, or host a man who was a member of the Dutch resistance movement. Uh, and uh, he carried a briefcase with him, according to my mother, uh, with plans to preemptively destroy the railroad center in Utrecht, hoping that by destroying that railroad center, it might slow down any invasion coming from Germany. But that morning, May 14th, they listened to the radio and heard that the port city of Rotterdam had been bombed. And a few minutes later, Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands came on the radio and announced that Holland had surrendered. And she advised people to continue to do their duty wherever they happen to find themselves. My parents were stunned. The first person to speak up was their guest, this man from the Dutch resistance movement. And he said in Dutch, thank God, it's over. As far as he was concerned, he had done what he could uh, to slow down any invasion, and he now would have to accommodate to living under an occupation. But for my parents, looking at their two kids, perhaps in a playpen, just like this, and knowing what had happened to their relatives in Poland and in Germany, they understood that they were going to be in for a very, very difficult time. And indeed, within a very short period, all of the restrictions and regulations humil and humiliations that had been placed on Jews in Germany suddenly were put in place in the Netherlands. People had to take on a new middle name, men, Israel, women, Sarah. They had to register all their properties so that it would be easier for that property eventually 
uh, to be confiscated. And there were some regulations that were just plainly meant to humiliate Jews. Jews were prohibited, for example, from using public transportation or from going into public parks. Well, when you have a regulation that makes absolutely no sense, you tend to ignore it. And that's, of course, it so happened. What my mother did, she continued to take the baby carriage with my little sister Leah into one of the neighboring parks near, not too far from our home. And one day my mother told me a German woman approached the baby carriage. And my mother's heart almost stopped because she knew she wasn't supposed to be there. But then the woman looked at my little sister playing with her blonde curls, pointed to her blue eyes, and then turned to my mother and said, ah, you can tell that this is good Aryan blood. But my mother thanked the woman and of course, never went back in the, to that park again. In spite of the occupation, my parents tried to go on with their normal lives. And for my mother's birthday, uh, photographs were taken of the family, my two sisters, Eva and Leah. And this is what a, um, a selfie would have been looked like in the 1930s. My sister Eva doing a little dance for the photographer. But this was also just about the time that my mother found out that she was pregnant again. She consulted her obstetrician and he told her that it would be immoral to bring another Jewish life into the world. And he very strongly advised her to have an abortion. But at this time, my mother told me she turned to the Bible for advice. And she read the story of Hannah. Hannah, you might recall, was a woman who would go to the temple every year and pray that she might conceive and have a child. And it was in reading of Hannah's agonizing desire to have a child that my mother decided that she could not possibly have an abortion. And so she disobeyed her obstetrician and I was born at home with the help of a nurse, November 23rd, 1941. Well, this brought about another dilemma in Jewish life. Jewish male children traditionally are circumcised uh, when they're eight days old. And my parents' friends, uh, friends said, don't have him circumcised. It will identify him as being Jewish. But this time, uh, the answer to their dilemma came in the form of a pediatrician who had just examined me. And he sort of frowned. And my father asked him, is there anything wrong with the baby? And the pediatrician smiled and said, no, it's just that your little boy needs a minor operation we call a circumcision. And so my father told them of a Jewish tradition. And indeed, eight days later, our family and friends gathered in our living room, probably for the very last time for an occasion like this in the Netherlands to celebrate this first milestone in a Jewish life. And here you can see my two sisters and uh, my father sitting right behind them uh, and a whole bunch of relatives. And this woman over here actually is Annie Madna. We'll hear a little bit more about her uh, and the crucial uh, play, uh, role she was to play uh, in my life uh, later on. And here I am somewhere, somewhere uh, on uh, this pillow. What makes these photographs very, very special is that they're very small. They're only about one by one and a half inch in size. And my mother was to carry these two small photographs on her body through her stay subsequently in 12 
concentration camps. And she developed this, this superstition that if she ever lost these photographs, it would mean that I had been killed. Fortunately, my mother survived, the photographs survived, and I survived. And the photographs are now part of the collection of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Well, here I am a bit older with my two sisters and probably I would say six, seven months old. Well, when I was about this age, probably closer to nine months, Jewish men were beginning to get notices to report for labor duty. And that's what happened to my father. And it prompted him. And it was a really this, these summonses were not just to any kind of labor duty, but it meant going to a concentration camp. It was a very good chance of being sent to a camp much further east in Poland. And so this was a signal of imminent danger to the entire Jewish community to try to try to find a place to hide. Well, my father went into hiding in a psychiatric hospital called the Remar Clinic, where he pretended to be a patient. My two sisters were the next ones to be placed, and they then they assumed a new Catholic identity. They were placed uh, with our two neighbors, the two Van Leuven sisters, two very devout Catholic women, both teachers. And here you have my two sisters uh, assuming their new Catholic uh, identity. At this point, my mother was left alone uh, with me uh, in the house. And my mother told me that it was one of the most frightening times of her life. She said that she would spend the entire day uh, listening for the doorbell to ring for fear that it might be uh, a, a, a Nazi policeman coming to the door to search the house. Uh, and then because she was so afraid of the doorbell ringing, she said she put a piece of cloth around the doorbell to dampen the sound. And then of course, she spent the entire night, she said, sitting on the stairs looking to see if the clapper of the doorbell moved. Well, fortunately, uh, uh, no one ever came to the house and my mother was able uh, to place me uh, with uh, Annie uh, Madna, a woman who lived across the street from us, another neighbor. And she took me there with a bundle of my diapers, my toys, and that's how Annie Matna was the first step uh, to offer a place, the first person to offer a place uh, to hide me and shelter me from the Nazis. At that point, my mother joined my uh, father in the same psychiatric hospital where he was hiding in her case, pretending to be a nurse. Well, my parents had one more uh, visit with my sisters, actually, uh, on Christmas Day, uh, 1941, 42, sorry, Christmas Day, 1942. And then just a week later, on New Year's Day, 1943, all of the Jews who had been hiding in a psychiatric hospital were arrested by the SS and sent to a concentration camp. During that visit uh, with my sisters is probably when my parents may have given permission for my two sisters to be baptized. And very recently, I found this particular re record in 1943 from the Elonstrad Church in The Hague, indicating that my, my two sisters were baptized on January 4th, January 11th, 1943. Well, Annie Madna had had some bad run-ins with the Nazis 
And so she first passed me on to her sister, Yurina. And a few years ago, I met Yurina's sister, Yurina's daughter, Dini, Dini Polak. And she told me that I slept in her parents' bed and between the two of them, between her parents, and that I constantly cried, that I was very unhappy. And because I had a neighbor who was a member of the Dutch Nazi party, they were afraid that he might hear me. And so that is how I finally was passed back to Annie and then from Annie to Annie's ex-husband, Tole Madna. Tole Madna was born in Indonesia and had come to the Netherlands in 1916 with his mother. His mother couldn't stand the Dutch climate, cold climate, and went back to Indonesia, but he remained and ended up managing an Indonesian restaurant. He uh, and Annie were married, uh, had three children, uh, and then eventually uh, divorced. And it is Tole Mata who now became my father, my pa, as I call him for the rest of his life. Uh, he had a nanny who had taken care of uh, their three children. And her name was Mima, Mima Saina. Mima was also born in Indonesia, but from a very, very poor background. She never learned to read or write, never learned the Dutch language, only spoke her native Indonesian language, now called Bahasa. But Mima had a heart of gold, and it is this woman who now became my mother. Mima would walk miles every day just to get milk for me. You know, a few years ago when I was in Holland, a woman stopped me and, and said, you know, you used to drink my milk. And I asked her, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, all children during the war years were given a small bottle of milk in school. And my mother told me to save half that little bottle for the baby next door. And you were the baby next door. So here you have it, a little child, seven or eight years old, already being told, taught to save a human life. I slept in Mima's bed and she kept a knife under her pillow, vowing to kill any Nazi who might try to come uh, and get me. But most of the memories that I have, maybe all of the memories I have of being with the Matna family and with Mima are happy ones. Here is Mima holding me, Tole Matna sitting at the piano, my foster sister, Devi Matna in between, and Vil Matna uh, holding a little dog. You know, Jewish male children who were placed in hiding were given a new name. And I was given the name Bobby. And to this day, when I'm in touch with the Madna family, I am still Bobby, not Alfred or Al. And I, for many years, thought I was called Bobby after the little dog. The theory being that if people on the outside heard Bobby being called, they would think, well, it's just a little dog they're calling. Well, I told that story to Davy Madna a few years ago. And uh, Davy started to laugh and she said, you're wrong. The, 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 little boy, the little dog's name wasn't Bobby, it was Teddy. So there went, you know, that entire uh, uh, theory. In all likelihood, you know, I was called Bobby because that name is very close to Rubby, the third Matna child, Rob Matna, the third of the three Matna children. I was never allowed out of the house, actually, um, uh, with one exception, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. Uh, but generally, I wasn't allowed out of the house at all for fear that people might stray, you know, a stray and very different looking child in the family. And I was never allowed to come near a window for fear, for the same fear that people might see a very, very different looking child. There were times when the house was being searched and I had to hide in a closet. But that's where I played with the Christmas decorations. And I thought it was just 
a game of hide and seek. Uh, there were times when there was severe hunger. And I remember one time, you know, feeling very hungry and seeing the table set uh, and going over to the table, sitting down and falling asleep with my head on the plate and that's how the family found me the following morning. Uh, by that time, this was up towards the end of the war. By that time, the only thing that was left to eat was tulip bulbs, which Holland, as you know, has plenty of. Well, there were only two little kids who were allowed to come into the house and play with me. And actually, I also had spent some time in their home, I found out. And these two little, little kids, their parents, uh, I was told by Papa Madna, by Toli Madna, were German and therefore were totally trusted to come and play with me. Well, I never knew the name of these two kids until less than a year ago, when this little boy saw an article in a Dutch newspaper reviewing a book that included my, the story of my rescue by the Madna family. And he recognized the photograph of a tiny Yotsi Yonwitcher, the little Jewish boy he used to play with. He contacted the author and the author put him in touch with me. And now I know that this little boy, his name is Arthur Friedowitzi and that this is Helga Friedowitzi. And he and I have been corresponding ever since. And I've also had some exchanges of emails with Helga. Uh, Arthur Friedowitzi is now 84 years old, little Arthur Friedowitzi. But at that time he was six and I was about three or four. And a six-year-old can remember his playmates, his little playmates, the three-year-old really cannot recollect. And I'm so glad now to finally uh, know Arthur Friedowitzi. And our plan is to go to, to Holland in October for a reunion, for meeting, a reunion uh, with his playmate of 75 years ago. <clears throat> Arthur told me uh, that early on when I was very little in the first year that I was with Papa Madna, he did take me out uh, on the street in a stroller and it sort of fits with the story that Devi Matna told me. She said that uh, Papa Madna enjoyed taking me out of the house as a little baby. And then he said, you know, people would stare at the little baby and look at him and ask him, who is that little baby? And he would simply answer them, that's my son. And then people, he said, would shake their heads and say, ah, poor Indonesian man doesn't know his wife has been sleeping around. That's the kind of sense of humor that Tole Matna had. And I think it's the kind of sense of humor that allowed him uh, to maintain a happy household for me during those terrible, terrible years uh, when, when every day uh, was a threat for him because he was hiding uh, a little Jewish boy. Here's another photograph of Papa Madna holding me and, uh, and sometimes was on the back of the photographs is even more significant. And here it says, he says, here's Mima and my son, Bob, because that's what Papa Madna, Tole Madna considered me for the rest of his life, his son. Well, we left my parents in the psychiatric hospital. Uh, and we left them there. And I told you uh, that then on New Year's Day, 1943, um, all they were sent to concentration camps. First to Westerbork. This is my mother's registration card in Westerbork. Uh, after Westerbork, they were sent on to a concentration camp in Fürth. And there they did slave labor for the Philips Electronics Factory. Uh, they remained in Furcht for uh, close to a year. Uh, 
And my mother told me that one day while in Fürth, they were addressed by a very high German official, Nazi official, none other uh, than Himmler himself. Himmler had Hitler's second in command. And he uh, exhorted the prisoners uh, to continue to work for the success of the Reich. He told them that if they continued to do so, nothing bad would ever happen to them. My mother told me that while he was speaking, she spotted a small, the spire of a small Dutch church in the background, in the distance. And she said it would be so wonderful if at that moment, peace were to break out and she could just run to that church, fall on her knees and thank God for having been liberated. She didn't care, she told me, whether it was a mosque, a church or a synagogue, just a place to thank God for her freedom. But that wasn't to happen. Himmler did not keep his promise. And indeed, a few months later, all of those prisoners, the prisoners who had been governed doing slave labor were sent on to Auschwitz. The first one to leave for Auschwitz was my father uh, in uh, March uh, 1944. My mother remained uh, in Fürth until June 1944, and then was sent on to Auschwitz uh, as well. A little difference of a few months may account for what ultimately uh, happened to them. The fact that my mother survived and my father uh, did not. My mother was sent on from Auschwitz almost immediately to a camp called Reichenbach, where she continued to do slave labor, this time uh, for another electronics company, Philip, oh, sorry, Telefunken or Siemens. And there she said she, she assembled radio tubes. That was the work she had learned was a, a way to, to, the, to contribute uh, to an essential element uh, near of, uh, necessary for the German war effort. <clears throat> And she said she worked alongside German soldiers who had been repatriated from the Eastern Front. And they were missing an arm or a leg and had become terribly, very much anti-Hitler. Did everything they could do to possibly sabotage the workings of the factory. And so it encouraged my mother to engage in her own little acts of sabotage. And she told me she would spend the whole day assembling one radio tube. Then when the siren was sounded at the end of the day, she would disassemble the radio tube, put the parts back in the drawer and start the process all over again the next day. There were other uh, forms of, of sabotage or resistance, if you will. My mother told me uh, that for the Hanukkah holiday, uh, the women in her in her group uh, <clears throat> decided that they needed to to observe the holiday by lighting candles, and so my mother went to the infirmary and uh, told the nurse there that she was having her menstrual period and needed a wad of cotton. She then took the wad of cotton, dipped it in the oil from the machine that she was working in and planted that in a potato. And that evening, the women lit the Hanukkah candle. Their act of defiance of the Nazis, and again, contributing to their ultimate survival. <clears throat> My mother witnessed the bombing of Reichenbach and uh, as she saw the factory go up in flames, she said the Jewish, traditional Jewish prayer of thanks to God for having survived to see that particular day. It wasn't the end of her ordeal because she was then sent on a whole series of death marches, uh, taking her to nine other camps until she was finally liberated uh, at the Swedish border through the intervention of the head of the, of the Danish border rather, and through the intervention of the head of the Swedish Red Cross, Count Folk Bernadotte.
The fate of my sisters was entirely different from mine, unfortunately. They remained with the Van Leeuwen sisters uh, for about a year. And then the local priest who had been searching for a place of safety for them that would be better than the two sisters, uh, found what he found was thought was a safer place uh, in the home of a woman called a woman, Rosalia Mazarowski. And so uh, she operated a small guest house. And that's where my two sisters ended up. They remained in that guest house for about eight months. But at that point, Rosalia's husband denounced her and my sisters to the Nazis. This was her second husband, Rosalia's second husband. And he was desperate to get hold of that small hotel that she had inherited from her first husband. And that's how he did now, why he denounced her to the Nazis. This is a, a picture that I found actually of the Dutch man who arrested my sisters. Uh, he, his name is Dirk and, and, and uh, the, the woman who had hidden them. His name is Dirk Vass, and here he is reading a copy of Mein Kampf. As a 20 year old, immediately after the invasion of the Netherlands, he volunteered to join the SS. He uh, fought on the Eastern Front, was injured and then sent back to Holland and then was given this plum job of arresting Jewish children. The people responsible for hiding uh, my sisters went to prison and here's a record of the uh, priest, Pater Ludders, uh, Pater Ludders being imprisoned, the Van Leeuwen sisters being sent to a prison. Uh, and Rosa, Rosalia Mazarowski uh, was also, was immediately sent to concentration camp, also in fact. She ended up eventually in Ravensbrück and barely survived a okay, terrible case of typhus. My sisters, however, were immediately taken to Auschwitz. And here is page 137 of a list of people taken from the Netherlands to Auschwitz. And right next to one of my sisters, my younger sister, uh, Dia, with her name in hiding, Annie, uh, right next to her, my uncle, Emil. This is somewhat of a mystery. But why Emil, who was in hiding himself, found himself on the same transport as my two sisters. And I believe that he found out that they had been arrested and did not want to leave them alone. He was very fond of my sisters. There's not even a record of his registration, his arrival in Auschwitz. And so the strong likelihood is that he was killed along with my sisters in Auschwitz on the day that they arrived, February 11th, 1944. So I never knew my sisters. I was reunited with my mother in July, the end of July, 1945, after the Holland had been liberated. And it's the first clear memory that I have. I remember being asleep in the one of the back rooms of the Magna house and Davy Martha coming to get me. And I was unhappy uh, because I am cranky. And so she carried me into the living room where the whole family had gathered in a circle. And they did what you do with a cranky child. You pass it from lap to lap. And there was one lap I refused to sit in. And that was my own mother. To me, she was a stranger and I kept pushing her away. My mother at that time was Mima, not this strange woman whom David called Tante Gisela. Well, very, very recently, I, from Arthur Friederici, I received this photograph 
taken the day after I was reunited with my mother. And here's my mother standing behind us. And here I am, and here is Helga Frideritzi. And it's Helga who's holding on to me, not my mother, because even then, my mother to me was still a complete stranger, and I would not let her touch me. Well, the plan was for Mima to continue care to care for me while my mother went out looking for work. But sadly, Mima had suffered a cerebral hemorrhage just two months later, September 30th, 1945. People said actually that she died of a broken heart because she was afraid that her baby was being taken away from her. I have very, very few memories uh, of Mima Sayina. The only physical memory that I have is really of visiting her grave, which I did so many times with Papa Mahna that when I returned to Holland many, many years later for a visit, I was able uh, to find the grave almost uh, without any kind of uh, assistance. Well, here's a photograph taken at, right after I was reunited with my mother as well, a few days later. I haven't told you yet what happened to my father. Here is a little piece of paper with his number 175442 as a prisoner in Auschwitz. And it indicates that he was entitled to a premium salary. Now, I asked the researchers, I found this at the Holocaust Museum, and I asked the researchers at the Holocaust, what does this, this little piece of paper mean? What is meant by a premium Auszahlung, a premium salary? And he explained that the prisoners who worked for companies earned uh, a salary, and that, that salary was actually paid to uh, the SS. And that's what sustained another way to sustaining uh, the German uh, war effort. Part of the crazy, crazy bureaucracy that was put in place by the Nazi regime. Well, my father went from Auschwitz uh, to Mauthausen, a horrible place where prisoners carried boulders up a ramp and were often tripped. Uh, and 100,000 men died in that fashion in Mauthausen. And then from Mauthausen, he was sent on uh, to a whole series of other camps, just as the uh, Soviet army approached from the east. So they were sent further and further west uh, in Austria and finally ended up in Gusen, Steyr, and finally in a camp called Ebensee. Ebensee is located in the Austrian Alps. It's a beautiful place. It's where the film Sound of Music was actually made and in that beautiful setting, there was a terrible concentration camp where the prisoners worked in underground abandoned salt mines, assembling V2 rockets for the German army. Terrible work, almost no food, never seeing daylight. My father lived long enough to see liberation by the US army, but was so weak, so debilitated, he died just two months later, July 19, 25th, 1945. This week actually marks on my father's yard site. And here you see that middle name that Jews were forced to take, Israel. The certificate here is issued originally by the German army. And he was buried in the concentration camp which is now one huge cemetery. These were photographs taken by my mother on her first visit to the camp sometime in 1952.
my father's grave at that time with the cross, which has since then been removed. Actually, all markers were removed from the camp, from the uh, uh, cemetery eventually, because people really did not know uh, the uh, religion of the individual uh, prisoners. <clears throat> well, in Holland, in the Hague, back in the Hague, uh, my mother had to start making a living and had to start life all over again. She acquired a cosmetics business uh, in the Hague. And here we are, the two of us in front of the cosmetics store. And Jewish life began again in Holland. And here's an array of my little friends. Here is Rosie Einhorn. Uh, I contacted her very recently, Margaret Landesmann uh, and some others. And here I am uh, dressed up I mean, as a collection box for the Jewish National Fund, my own personal Purim costume, with one which won me first prize, a costume made entirely uh, by uh, my mother. While I remained in close contact with Papa Madna, with Tole Madna, this is actually the Holocaust Museum's favorite photograph. You know, he tried to bring a little bit of his Indonesian village into the Hague. And so he kept chickens uh, in uh, the backyard. And you can see that I was not too fond of his chickens. He saw us off uh, in 1958 when my mother and I left for the Netherlands. Here he is. And he remarried and this is his second wife, Mary, and three children, Vani, Tole, and Matipa. Uh, from his second uh, marriage. And as I said, I remained very, very close in touch with him and I remained part of his family. Here's my graduation picture from college, a little bit less visible, my graduation picture from medical school as Tole Matna plays the piano. And here we are in front of my personal Anne Frank house. Uh, in front of Hans Bergenstraat, number 40. And here I am with Bill Matna and Rob Matna and with Davy Matna. And this is the very, very last photograph that I have with Tolde Matna. It was taken just two months before he died. That's when my partner Joel and I visited him. And his last words to me, People said that he kept himself alive because he wanted to see his son from America one last time. And his final words to me were, take care of your mother, because that's the kind of person he was, always much more concerned about the other person than he was about himself. People asked him, why did you risk your life and the lives of your family to save a Jewish baby? And his answer was a simple one. What else was I to do? To him, it wasn't a choice, but a given. To stand up even when surrounded by hate and to continue to do what is right. And here's my very favorite picture of Tole Magma. And the Madna family was honored at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem as righteous among the nations. And here you see uh, the two names with in parentheses the word Indonesia uh, behind them. Uh, just a few weeks ago, someone else from Indonesia uh, was added uh, to that list. And I continue to tell the story and share the story uh, of how Papa Magna came to rescue me and from the Nazis uh, to his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And then as you heard earlier, a uh, few about nine years ago or so, eight years ago, I shared the story with a group of students uh, in a Temple University, students of Raisel Wyman, who were here to learn about what it is to live in a society, uh, in a religiously diverse society. And I told them the story just like I told you, and these students had never 
really didn't know much about the Holocaust. I'd never met anyone who was Jewish. And then at the very end of the story, I told them that there was one thing that I do remember about Farmima, and that was that she sang a lullaby to me. And let's hope that you can hear it. I vaguely remember that he, she used to sing a lullaby to me, and it was called Nina Bobo. And all 25 students started singing the lullaby, Nina Bobo, in perfect unison. All these students from very, very different backgrounds came up to me, hugged me, kissed me, and said that we were all one family. I hope you all were able to hear that if I uh, did this correctly on, on uh, sitting here on Zoom. Uh, I've repeated that story to other groups of Indonesian students. This is a group of Indonesian students uh, visiting the Holocaust Museum with the exact same reaction. They too started singing Nina Bobo, the wonderful melody. And with the same reaction at the end, we are family. And that to me is the most important message I always try to convey is that I hope that ultimately the world, you know, we've been through so many genocides and I'll talk about that in just a second, but I hope that eventually the world might learn that we are all part one of one human family and we might finally just celebrate uh, our common humanity. As I said, you know, and as you all know, the Holocaust wasn't the last genocide. It did not spell an end to hate or bigotry or mass murder. And here I am uh, in Scotland with Anchorn Pond, a child survivor of the Khmer Rouge. We were both, we were in uh, Scotland to share our stories there uh, with the students. And after three days uh, of sharing our stories, ultimately, Arn started sharing his, my story, and I started his story, his story, his story of being imprisoned by the Khmer Rouge uh, and only surviving because he learned to play an instrument uh, for uh, his captors. Uh, sound that was used to cover, uh, sound of the instrument that was used to cover the sound of skulls being cracked. Here we are in the classroom, as I said, sharing our stories. And then much more recently, I had occasion to meet this young man, Omar al Shogre, a survivor of a very current genocide or mass murder, if you will, that's happening right now in Syria. Omar, was arrested as a 14 year old for painting graffiti, uh, asking for freedom, uh, putting in prison at age 14 and being there tortured for three years by the Assad regime until he was finally liberated. This is a photograph of Omar uh, at the time that he was liberated, liberated only because his mother was able to get $15,000 together uh, to, to buy uh, his freedom. And here I am again here with, with Omar al uh, and with my good uh, friend Moaz Mustafa on the far right. Omar and Aras uh, and Moaz Mustafa. Uh, Omar has now become uh, a very key figure in telling the story of what is happening in Syria, keeping that story before the American public. And here we are uh, at a hearing uh, held before the House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee.
Well, this is really the end of my story. The story of one small family during the Holocaust and the lessons that I believe that story conveys. It is that even when surrounded by hate, it is possible and incumbent on all of us to continue to do the right thing. And with the ultimate hope that we might yet find, create or leave behind a world free entirely of hate. And now I'm very, very glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, uh, Al. Uh, always, I always see. What's this? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I am what always. question was this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you able to hear the lullaby? The yes, sound? we were. Yes, we were. Thank you so much for that. Okay. <laughs> and I did put a link for anybody in the chat about seeing the whole video, little the video that we created when we went to. Uh, it's filmed in Israel and uh, uh, and in the United States that you could that was uh, shown at the Indonesian embassy in Washington. So that short video from YouTube I put on the uh, chat. Um, uh, one of the questions that is asked by uh, one of the uh, a community asks you if your mother talked to you about her experiences in the concentration camps. Yes, you know I uh, you know I grew up as a youngster with the consequences of the Holocaust all around me. You know, to me, growing up uh, among children who were minus a parent or a brother or a sister was entirely normal. You know, walking with my mother across a whole field of rubble uh, because part of our city of The Hague had been destroyed was normal. And so I, did, I, I never understood, for example, what had happened to my sisters. Uh, you know, people would tell me wonderful stories about them. Uh, they would tell me how perfect my sister Eva's handwriting had been. And so I grew up actually slightly jealous uh, of my sisters. And it is very slowly that my mother began to talk about what had happened to her and to the family. You know, I heard people say such and such a person did not come back. And that person, and you were lucky because your mother, quote, came back. And that's when I became to, came to understand, for example, that my sisters and my father had gone somewhere and did not come back. And eventually, eventually, people would say, well, your sisters are with God. That was one thing that I heard. And very, very gradually, the whole story unfolded. But it took many, many years, actually. You're, you're muted, myself. I try to do that so we have clarity from you. Uh, has anybody else would like to ask a question? Um, yeah, Golda, Golda is ready if you, one of our teachers, if you allow. Did you to, unmute her? Okay, yeah, thank I'll you. Yeah, I can talk. Golda, please. Golda, are you there? Yeah, she has. Golda? Is she ready? Because if not, there's another question from Kinsey. Yeah, uh, let's go to the question first. Okay. She asked about all the documents that you have. You have family pictures. How did you find these hidden, these photos hidden and then revealed? And I was just going to comment on how you continue to uncover. It's extraordinary. But could you tell Kinsey how she how you did it and how you pulled all that uh, information together? Well, fortunately, you know, neighbors were able to say all of the family photographs, uh, and that's really you know and. Uh, I sat down with my mother, basically, going through that box of photographs. And that's why I gradually, gradually developed the story. Uh, and then, you know, just following up a little bit on my, or my earlier answer, uh, you know, after the television series Holocaust that was shown uh, in the 1960s, 
that's when I sat down with my mother with a big map and asked her to really tell me in detail what had happened to the entire family. And that's when I began you know, to, to find, also to look for documents. Uh, the International Tracing Service provided me with some documents and some things were just, you know, this throughout COVID, I had nothing, I had you know, plenty of time to, to, to Google. And I, I, at one point, for example, I put in the name of the priest whom I had met after the war, Pater Luders. Uh, he used to visit my mother's store on his motorcycle. And I knew that he had played a role uh, in trying to save my sisters. And so I, I Googled his name, came up with, a, an article in a church bulletin uh, and about Pater Lutters and his efforts to save Jewish children. Again, I, man, I contacted the church. They put me in touch with the woman who had written the article, Trace Kranz. And then you know, she provided me with much further information about Pater Lutters uh, and the fact that he had been imprisoned eventually. That led me to a book about the prison where he was uh, held, which had in the back of it, all of the names of the prisoners, including the two Van Leeuwen sisters. And that's how gradually the whole story of my sisters came uh, together. And then there was a young woman who was doing research at the Holocaust Museum, a young woman from Germany who was writing her doctoral dissertation on the role of women in saving Jewish children. And uh, she was interested in the woman who tried to save my sisters. And I told her, she approached me and I said, well, you know, I, I really don't know anything about her. And then she told me that there was a criminal record available in The Hague that included the names of my sisters, a criminal record pertaining to the man who had arrested them. And that's how she found this woman's name. Unfortunately, the document was protected uh, by Dutch, very strict Dutch privacy laws and could only be seen in person. And of course, during COVID, I could not go you know, to The Hague. So again, I found someone whom I, who had contact me, contacted me uh, because his two nieces were on the same transport to Auschwitz as my sisters. And so he, I had been corresponding with it and he volunteered to go to The Hague and look at that document. And that's how I found out the rest of the story about my sisters. So it's a very, very slow process that is still happening. I'm still finding out details, sometimes very painful details uh, about what happened to my family. <clears throat> Marcel, please unmute yourself. Marcel. I'm being very responsible by not. <laughs> uh, we know that every story is unique. Every child, you know, has a different story. Every, but what is quite striking about how uh, and the way that, that your particular testimony is being um, forwarded in an incredible way is the uh, uh, becoming ac uh, accessible to the Indonesian population and, and also by extension, the Muslim population because 90% um, of Indonesians are Muslim. What are the special things that have happened because of that? And I want to, you know, and the kind of things that I'd like you to bring up is that the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum where you do an awful lot of volunteering uh, and speaking, uh, by virtue of the interest in your story might've been the catalyst for having the Holocaust uh, websites being translated into Bahasa, Indonesia, other kinds of things that have come out of this and how else has it been? Uh, I know some of the stories and I myself am working with some Indonesian students on your story, but what are some of the other uh, ways that this has been exponentially told in a new community that never heard the stories of the Holocaust? Well, I, for one, uh, I ran into a uh, young woman, a teacher, who was visiting the Holocaust Museum, actually. She was from Indonesia, a journalist, uh, and she was so fascinated by the story that she ended up making a small documentary. Um, she actually you know, pursued me. I was in Cambodia at the time, visiting Archorn Pond, and she came to Cambodia and filmed me, interviewed me, 
And she turned that into a, a message that you could share uh, with, with groups in Indonesia. Uh, the other program is the, the Holocaust Museum uh, has a program uh, together with UNESCO uh, to bring Holocaust education uh, to places around the world, uh, including Indonesia. And they too uh, have a group of uh, Indonesian people collaborating in that particular program uh, to, to, to bring the story to Indonesia. So many, many different ways. And I, I could, again, there too, it continues to evolve. And uh, I have encouraged the museum, for example, and I'm work, we're working now uh, with the help of Zoom, actually, to bring the story uh, to Indonesia uh, and, and to other communities, especially Muslim communities. Uh, I also created a, uh, met with a uh, filmmaker uh, who, from Iran, uh, who has a, a, a uh, operates something called Iran Wire, and he made, uh, again, a documentary of my story uh, directed specifically uh, to address the Holocaust denial uh, in Iran. Again, the story because of the family with Indonesia and because uh, Mima Salina uh, was Muslim, has tremendous residence uh, in uh, the Muslim community you say is one of your greatest um, moments of pride in telling this story? There have been so many, but probably the greatest, I think, was that time when I was in Philadelphia telling the story to the Indonesian students. That and their reaction afterwards and bring, you know, let me tell you something about Nina Bobo that I haven't even shared with you, Raisel. So I did not know what the lullaby was called until the Yad Vashem ceremony uh, where the family, the Madna family was honored. And the teacher in Holland who, who recreated uh, the, uh, the events, the story uh, in a play performed by students at the American school uh, in The Hague, uh, one of the things that she had, the, the, there was a young Vietnamese girl who played the part of Mima, and she had asked that little girl, that little, well, not that little, that, uh, Indo that Vietnamese student to sing Nina Bobo. And I heard the melody, and it immediately, immediately recognized it. And that's when I learned that it was called Nina Bobo. But until then, you know, I really did not remember the name. All I remembered, all I remembered really uh, was the melody. And then to hear the melody again, sung by students from Indonesia, was an incredibly gripping moment. It really, you know, it's just an amazing moment that I will never forget. Uh, your mother was an incredible woman. Uh, by much of our conversation together, uh, the kind of person she was. What were some of the, uh, re after surviving so many concentration camps, kind of surviving the death of her daughters and her husband and uh, making sure she got back to her child, what was, tell us some of the few things that you find so remarkable about her so that we will remember her too. The interest of this, the, the, my mother lived, I think, first of all, if there was one trait that defined her, it was defiance. And she never wanted Adolf Hitler, I think, to have the last word. And that, I think, was true to the very end of her life. Her very last gesture before she passed away was the raised fist. And she took my arm, tried to get me to do it also. Be strong, stand up, you know. Don't let anything get you down. That was my mother's uh, attitude. Uh, she also prized the idea of bringing different people together. Uh, and that's really where I learned, you know, one of the, I think it's one of the reasons why I share the story of my family uh, with different groups. I remember it was, it must have been my sixth, my birthday, my sixth birthday when, uh, uh, my mother had uh, created a cake 
actually. Uh, it, was, it was really not a cake, it was really a big pudding and with little, little things on top that were mimicking uh, candles because that was my favorite thing was pudding, not cake. Anyway, but what was remarkable was that she counted all the different religions gathered around the table. There were the Madnas who were somewhat Muslim, Catholic, and then, you know, the Van Leeuwen sisters who were strictly Catholic, uh, some very good friends from Rheinsberg uh, who were probably involved in hiding my uncle Emil, who were strict Protestant. Uh, there was a man called Srul Tabaksplat, who was actually a Jewish convert to Christianity. And she brought all of these different people together. And she would count off the different religions. And that was a tremendous uh, uh, source of pride uh, to her. And she never had any rancor to, to people from Germany as a, as a group. She always felt that people needed to be judged as individuals, uh, not uh, to the group that they belonged to. So, you know, she was really an, an amazing woman. Uh, and, and, you know, she was an artist, resumed painting after she retired. Uh, and I was able, you know, to, to go on with life remarkably. It is not that she, that she in any way forgot, ever forgot her losses. She, you know, the portrait, she always kept the portraits of my sisters on the wall. Uh, she always remembered my father uh, and made sure that I did. You know, one of the first things she made sure of is that I learned the first words of Hebrew with the Kaddish so that I could observe my father's yard site properly. So, you know, but at the same time, at the same time that she remembered and knew what had happened, she really wanted to make sure that the world learned those lessons. Al, it's a privilege always. Uh, you have a gift, both of both delivery and the, the thoughtfulness that you add to the to this whole week that we've had that's focused on the child's experience in the Holocaust, who the child is and not to, remind, not to forget their spirit. Uh, is there one last thing you'd like to say to our teachers before we go, besides that you thank them well, as they thank sure. you? I really want to thank them all for being here and being taking the time to take this course uh, and taking the time to learn the lessons of the Holocaust because it's only by spreading those lessons uh, to students, to young people, uh, that, that we may yet achieve a better world, a world that finally might be free of hate uh, and bigotry, and a world where we all, as I said earlier, celebrate our common humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure, and again, I will continue with that incredible work with the memoirs that you're writing and to the people you're reaching to that are far across the ocean and far away that we know are in uh, harmony with us on trying to create a better place. Thank you so much, Al. Thank you everybody thank you. for thank you everybody for attending. Um, we um, have, uh, of course, uh, as mentioned earlier, and also in the chat, uh, some other programs uh, coming up. Also, as you heard from Al, who is doing important work also beyond the Holocaust focus uh, with survivors, child survivors of other genocides, and we have in fact a child survivor of the Rwandan genocide, with whom, in fact, Rosella also has been working for a long time and actually being a host mother to her in the United States, who is going to be coming on tomorrow morning. I, again, just follow the links that I posted. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming. Uh, the presentation, the testimony provided really powerful and important insight that worked so very well and uh, supported the various teachings and insights provided in the course of the symposium. We heard so much from it that I think we're going to be having uh, to you know, grapple with and reflect on for, for days and weeks to come uh, from rescuers, right? So what motivates an Indonesian men to take in uh, a Jewish baby and this Jewish child in this regard, right? The story 
of altruism, but again, let's always remind ourselves that this was really a small minority and that the majority of people there, even in the occupied Netherlands, if at all, might fall more into, in fact, the overall reign of the police officer who then arrested uh, the two sisters of our speakers. You have the story of, of course, survival in hiding and uh, you know, the fate of Jewish children, uh, which of course also was quite distinct in the Netherlands compared to other testimonies we heard. Uh, there's a symposium from accounts from uh, people being hiding in Poland or trying to escape on the kinder transport or trying to escape like on a train via Lisbon and then like a long ordeal of eight months through Nazi occupied uh, Germany. So there's, of course, a lot there and more will be explored. So, but now, of course, first and foremost, thanks, Dr. Münzer. Thanks to Russell. Thanks to everybody here uh, in the audience. Please be well. Please be safe. This pandemic is not over. Uh, all the very best and see you all before too long. And to the teachers now, we're going to be continuing at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, with our session on Anne Frank uh, by Tally Dippold from Queen's University. Thank you.